all set? Anything gonna happen? Okay. Uh, we also make these things, they're antibodies, they're part of our immune system. Uh, they have this little pocket here that binds different proteins. You know, you get infected with a virus, and these things start to evolve in order to bind uh, proteins of viruses. These things are interesting, they're membrane channels that let things from the outside of cells into cells and vice versa. And um, these are very important for, for purifying molecules. Um, I'd like to be able to make all of these kinds of things. And I started out in biophysics. I did protein design. I made one of the first unnatural large proteins by designing it on paper, designing the gene, sticking to bacteria, expressing it, crystallizing it. But the thing was a molecular boat anchor. It took me four years to make it. And I didn't know how to make another one because proteins are horrible to work with. They are soft, squishy, jello-like things that they're just not good materials to try and design with. That was my, uh, my problem with it. So you can make wonderfully functional things, you know, take a bunch of proteins, fold them at 38 degrees for a month, and you'll get wonderful things like eagles and us and trees. But if you take them out of their comfort zone, even for a few minutes, they turn into uh, something that's delicious but not very functional. I, I used this last week. Um, so this is what I came up with, is what if we make building blocks that don't link together through a single bond, but they're flexible and have to make these large chains that then have to fold, and that folding process is very difficult to predict. Why don't we make proteins out of, why don't we make things like proteins, but make them out of building blocks that are rings and link together through pairs of bonds, so you make stiff ladder molecules, and then by hanging groups off of these ladder molecules and by putting a bunch of these together, I can make molecules that have pockets inside of them that can operate on other molecules. And I can do all the things that proteins do, but do it in a completely different way. Um, and we've been doing this. I, I invented this about 13, 14 years ago. We've been making molecules, figuring out how to synthesize the building blocks, make the molecules, make molecules that do things. This is one that mimics a, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that's in our brain that hydrolyzes acetylcholine, the neurotrans neurotransmitter, between every neural pulse. You dump out all this acetylcholine, then there's this fantastic enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that goes in, reacts it with water, deactivates it, so now it, you, the synapse is ready for the next thought to come through. And if you, get in, if you get exposed to organophosphorus nerve agents, for instance, they go in there, jam that protein, and fuse your, your nervous system. That's why nerve agents kill us so effectively. So we've got money from, we had money from the Department of Defense to understand this thing, to try and make catalysts like this, and especially to try and make molecules that can detoxify nerve agents. Um, this, this little simple molecule is much smaller and simpler than an enzyme, but it does what an enzyme does. You put in starting materials, it'll convert it to products, and this is time on the axis here, this is how much product is being generated. And when we hold all of these three groups in just the right three-dimensional constellation, this constellation, then they can convert the starting material into the product without themselves being consumed. And they speed up the reactions, the two of them. They speed the first one up about 2,500 fold and the second one up about 150 fold. Now the enzymes in our body speed things up trillions of fold. There's wizardry going on in here. Uh, and we haven't achieved that yet, but these are very tiny and so I need to make larger things to do the sorts of things that our, our enzymes do. So what we're doing now is we're starting to link these segments together to create big molecules that have many, many points of configuration. And now we have an enormous design problem. Designing something like this to catalyze a particular reaction or act as a membrane channel is an enormous design challenge. And the software tools to do this don't exist. That's why I'm writing it. And I've written it a couple of times. And I would write a program that would sort of be a graphical user interface to stitch together our building blocks. And then my students would come up with some chemistry that would let us put more stuff on it, but it wouldn't work with my old software. And I was writing all the C++ code and then hooking it into Python and then using Python libraries to do the, you know, the graphics. And um, I was, it was driving me crazy trying all this stuff together. And, and then, you know, they come up with new chemistry and I have to throw it away and start over again. And, it's just a nightmare. So I finally decided what I need is a language. I need a programming language that works, does for molecules, what things like Mathematica or MATLAB does for mathematics or physics. Um, right, because I want to, you know, I want to build things like where I take multiple segments, multiple segments like these guys, tie them together and create pockets, and, and I want to design them. So I need an oracle that could, 
can help me design these molecules. Something where I can give the requirements of a functional molecule, and I know what that means as a chemist. I know where groups need to be in space. So I need a scaffolding behind it to hold those groups in place. Um, but I need some sort of software that will take a functional, the requirements of a functional molecule and give me a sequence that my students then can go in the lab and make in a couple of weeks. If we could do this, we could solve, I think, all of the world's problems. Um, so a lot of people are doing computational materials design, and they take this sort of approach, where they'll build a large sort of virtual library of molecules, and then run them through a series of successive sort of computational filters, until they come down with a small set that may do what they want, and then they'll go and buy those compounds or try and make them to see if they're active. For something of this, that works with small sorts of molecules, like the ones we've made up until now. But for these larger ones, that's not going to work. The, the space here is just too huge. I mean, we're talking about 10 to the 60th, the 10 to the 160th molecules of this size that I could make. Uh, it's no way you can, you can even build a starting set. Uh, so the way to do it is to start with a random configuration and then use Monte Carlo. You know, when you want to search a very large space that is just completely intractable to search exhaustively, you start at one point and then you randomly mutate and you try and find local optima. And that is, that is proven again and again to work for, for large search problems. But that requires a very different set of software tools and it really requires language. You need to run a Monte Carlo loop in a very tight loop in one processor. And so I've designed a new language for that. It's called CANDU, and it stands for Computer-Aided Nanostructure Design and Optimization. And what it does is it runs, it extends CLASP. So CLASP is the common list that I told you that I was implementing last year. And I've been continuing to develop it, of course. It's the foundation of CANDU. So CLASP is a is common list. It is a implement, it's the 13th sort of implementation of common list. It's probably still running right now. Uh, I know the world doesn't need another, probably doesn't need of common list. This one's interesting because it interoperates with C++ and it's based on LLVM, so that's new about it. But, you know, it doesn't really need it. What I do need is something to rest this on. And that wasn't going to work on any other common list that exists right now because I need C++ integration. There's lots of C++ libraries that I need to tie into that I'm not going to rewrite, so I need to tie into them efficiently. And so that's why I've developed, developed can do. Okay, so what is it? So, uh, Flask is a common list implementation. CanDo adds 155,000 lines of C++ source code that I wrote to CLASP's 186,000 source lines of code, which consists of about 150,000 lines of C++ and 26,000 lines of uh, common list code that I stole from ECI. Thanks. Um, <laughs> What CanDo does is extends class by adding 239 C++ classes that become first class built-in objects within common list. You know, just like fixed num or double or hash tables, I got atoms now, and I got molecules, and I got conjugal prelog stereochemistry, and I've got force field parameters, and force field parameters. I've got all sorts of chemistry stuff in there that's first class, memory managed, garbage collected classes, built in C++, um, so they're very, they're pretty efficient. Uh, right, it gives you atoms, bonds, all sorts of stuff that uh, chemistry needs, and it's all managed by the GC. And CanDo is also now a growing body of common list code that uses all this stuff. I mean, it technically it's not common list, but it's a superset of common list. In principle, though, we could port all this stuff back to other common lists now, but it's CanDo common list source code that's extending this thing. Okay, so what can it do? It can represent molecular structures. Um, uh, molecules are graphs. They're like atoms or nodes. They're, they point to each other. That's the bonds. So you get this uh, unidirectional graph. Um, I want to be able to build those things and then throw them away. So I need them to be garbage collected. I can't use reference counting because I have loops all over the place and they'll stick around. So I need a serious real garbage collector. Um, uh, CanDo has built-in force fields. So it's got Nonlinear optimization of energy functions, complex energy functions. I need to be able to put new energy terms into it. So I'd like to use things like maxima to different to generate symbolic dif dif do different symbolic differentiation in common list, and then generate fast native code to imp to evaluate the function, the first derivative and the second derivative. I do that now. Um, it's got things like automatic type assignment that probably doesn't mean much 
to people here, but it's, it's a way of doing uh, these energy calculations. It knows about stereochemistry. It's got something like regular expressions for molecular fragments. It's called SMARTS. I didn't invent this, but I've implemented it inside of class, can, or can do. And um, basically, it lets you build really complex, powerful chemistry tools that run fast and scale in, in, in uh, can do common list. You can also tie in other libraries. So OpenMM is a molecular modeling package written in C++ with a very powerful C++ API. They've exposed it to Python, but it's like putting a jet engine behind a donkey. It's just horrible. <laughs> um, um, and I want to tie all these other sorts of libraries, like graphics libraries and electronic structure calculation libraries and docking libraries. I want to tie them into can do so I can drive them from that code. Okay, so let me give you a little test case. Okay, this is a molecule here. This is a little thing that I'm, I'm working on right now that I think could, you know, with further development, could help stave off the collapse of human civilization so that we have time to fix all of our other problems. You heard me right. I think this is a really, really important project. The idea is to make perfect water filters, right? And we've got funding now from the Department for the Army Corps of Engineers to um, develop this thing. Well, let me show you what I'm Here. Okay, we can see scale. Bring this up here. Bring this up here. All right, so we can see that there. That's why I don't have my glasses. All right, so um, this is. Uh, let me just show you how fast this is to start up. So this is slime. Can do. So I'm starting up slime. Now it's already compiled slime, so it's it's uh, pretty quick. Okay, there we are. We get slime up. All right. So what this is? Oh, okay. So here we have at the top is the common list source code, the can do common list source code that I've written to build some molecules. All right. So this first is initialization stuff. So what it does is setting directories. It's requiring. It's bringing in ASDF because of my my uh, can do common list code is. AS, ASDF systems. Um, so I just evaluate that. Bam, it's evaluated. Keep going down. Okay, here's a bunch of functions that do things like uh, uh, maintain lines and build unit cells and do conversions from degrees into radians, build unit cells for, uh, for making uh, three dimensional arrays of things. Um, it's just a bunch of functions all written in can do common that do a bunch of housekeeping stuff for me here. And let's just go to edit the root macro. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna evaluate, compile all these functions here. Okay, so they're compiled, keep going down, set a directory, but there's some cool stuff coming in a second. Okay, here what I'm doing is I'm, I, I sketch a molecule in a program called ChemDraw, which lets me just like, it's a, it's the program that chemists use to draw molecules. It's like a, it's like a, you know, Adobe Illustrator, but for molecules. And so we sketch a molecule in there, and I can write it out as an XML file from ChemDraw. And so CanDo can load this XML file, and it builds a graph of the molecule. But it doesn't have any three-dimensional uh, coordinates or anything. Um, I can set a thing called stereochemistry. Every carbon can have, like, what's called S or R stereochemistry. It's two different three-dimensional arrangements of groups around it chemistry concept, so I can set those here. Um, and then what I'm going to do is build a three-dimensional structure of this molecule. Let me show you how it works here. So I'm going to set up all the energy calculation stuff that's done. I'm going to, uh, here's, okay, so here's what I start with. There's probably about a thousand atoms in this molecule. I have no structural information at all, so they all start out at zero, zero, zero. This uh, three-dimensional object, all these atoms are at the same point in space. Um, to get started, I just assign random coordinates, and there's my molecule to start with. Okay? Uh, to get a reasonable three-dimensional structure, I use what's called energy minimization. It basically describes all the chemical bonds as springs that have to be a certain length, and they've got a certain tension to them. Bond angles, where you got atom, 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 those are also springs, and they, they control the angle. And all of that chemistry knowledge is built now into the structure of this thing that I loaded. 
And um, what I'm doing here is a nonlinear optimization that minimizes the energy by moving the atoms in order to get all the restraints satisfied as well as possible. So this is written in C++, and this is using uh, steepest descent, conjugate gradients, and then a truncated newton raphson uh, minimizer um, using energy functions that I calculate the derivative of, and then I use code generation in order to generate efficient code to evaluate those functions. So it runs pretty quick, but it's going to take a little while to minimize, so I'm just going to control C. Okay, so we have SLDB up here. Um, I just control C it, so I can look, you know, I can go in and look at the backtrace and look at arguments and functions. It's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty good debugger. Um, I can quit out of that. Uh, let's bring that up there. Okay, so now um, I want to see what I built. All right. So now this is a prototype for a water channel. This is a prototype for a molecule that it's like aquaporin in our kidneys. It's a protein that maintains the osmotic balance across cell membranes to keep them from bursting. And it is almost a perfect filter for water. It doesn't let anything else through, just water. And um, right now we're, you know, in California, they're building this huge re uh, reverse osmosis mem Five minutes? Wow, okay. They're building this huge reverse osmosis plant in order to purify water. Um, this, this thing could work a thousand times more efficiently than this current existing technologies for reverse osmosis membranes. But we have to first demonstrate that computationally. Um, so what I, this is just a prototype of one channel. The idea is the water would come in from here, go down through here, and then come out the other side. But I need to pack these into a two-dimensional membrane to start doing a simulation. So um, that's what I do here. So I build a two-dimensional array of these things. And then I put them up, and there's a two-dimensional array. Now, um, a simulation in water isn't complete without water. So let's go down and get the waters. Uh, I'll skip the other stuff there, evaluate that, get a water box. OK, so here's what the water looks like. OK, so this is a. Box of waters that somebody else, box of waters that somebody else generated that I need to pack around this thing in order to set up for a simulation. So um, let me just close this. Um, how am I get lost here? So I need to build a. I'm gonna not say as many words here. I need to build. I, I, what I do is I tile four of these boxes of water in order to encompass the entire membrane. Uh, close that and um, start carving out pieces. <coughs> so I'm just evaluating this stuff in slime here. Um, okay, this is interesting. So these two functions here, molecule in a box, what that determines is I build a bounding box, which is a clause class that describes the bounds of a box. And then I have all these water, this huge number of water molecules. What the molecule in a, in a bo in box function does is it just tests the water to see if it's inside a box or not inside the box. I don't want to do this stuff in C++. I wish, nor a couple of months ago, I would have never thought to do it anywhere but C++ because this has to be fast. But now this is fast enough, I can run it in common list. This function here will take that entire box of waters and test every water to see if it's in the box and throw out the ones that are not in the box. So um, compile that. Uh, build my two water boxes, and now what I've done is I've, I've sort of got a water box on the top and the bottom so that now I can insert the membrane into it. Um, and show you the whole thing. So now this is ready for simulation. So I've, I've, I've built a molecule inside a can-do. I've set up a whole simulation, put water boxes around it. It's all ready now to put into like one of these molecular, mechan molecular dynamics engines to simulate this thing. When you do that, this is what you see. So you're some of the first people to see this. So this is a, a, a simulation that took several days of uh, computer
computer time to simulate a few nanoseconds of time. The, the water here and above and below is hidden. It's those waters up there. And all we're seeing here is these water molecules that filter, that sort of flush into the voids in the membrane. Um, and uh, since they flow in this way and they flow in that way, it's pretty clear that they would flow up. They would flow down if we applied any kind of pressure. And we calculate how effective this thing could be as a water filtration membrane. Five grams of it, if you hold it in the palm of your hand, could create a membrane the size of a football field, a soccer pitch. Uh, and but and and uh, about a third of that would be space that's available for water to pass through. It would be a pipe the size of a third of a football field, to provide enough water for a city, and it would not require the kind of pressures that we need right now. Basically, a column of 27 feet of water would fall through this membrane. Right? This there there is no theoretically there is no way in this universe to make a better membrane than this, and this could be used to purify anything, water, all sorts of matter. So right now, this is a theoretical material, uh, but it, I hope I, I can, we, my lab can make this and we can test it. So I'm just trying to get money right now to to build this this stuff. And but this simulation is only about four weeks old. I've only just gotten to this point where it can do is fast enough to do what I just showed you here, where I've been able to build molecules again after a couple of years of of just working on the common lisp stuff. Okay, I have um, I'd love to talk to you about all sorts of other stuff, implementation details. I've Mentions one other thing. So, CLASP is a common list. It's based on C++. It's got LLVM. And what I figured out in the last couple of weeks is that I can take the C++ code and compile it to LLVM IR. I can take the common list code and compile it to LLVM IR. I can link those together, and then when LLVM passes inlining on, everything will get inlined into everything. Everything that makes sense. And anything that doesn't make sense because it's too big will get uh, promoted to what's called a fast call, fast CC calling convention where the register matching and stuff. Basically, I can hook into C++ code with no overhead compared to C++ talking to C++, common list code talk to C++ with no overhead. It's very easy to expose C++ libraries inside of class common list. Ask me and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. But basically, if you want to expose a C++ function, you just write the C++, you, you have it in your code, you put CLDefun in front of it, and my scraper will find it, build an interface, and make it available to the common list of environment. All of CLASP is exposed that way. There's thousands of functions that are exposed that way. Okay, then. Thank you very much. Yes. So you would compute the potential of the field of experience of the water and ions for the large parts of the class for the water, and then optimize on that. Uh, no. Uh, so what you would do is you would build, you would throw some ions into this yeah. these water areas here, and you would do what the, what you see here. This is this is a molecular dynamic simulation. This is simulating the motion of molecules. By, by calculating the forces, moving the atoms a little bit, calculating the forces again. It's hideously slow. It takes days to simulate nanoseconds of time. But that's what NAMD and that's what all these molecular dynamics engines do very well. What I'm doing here is I'm, I've got all the code to set up the calculations very quickly and efficiently, but set them up in a way where I can make millions of different variants of them and run these simulations on hundreds of thousands of CPUs in parallel, and then automatically uh, evaluate them and figure out which channels are working better than others. But, but, but what you can do uh, with the MSIs is the obstacle the membrane uh, builds up over some time, that you get some organic yeah. compound that you want to filter from. Yeah. Actually, this is a Yeah, you know, this, is, this is periodic boundary conditions. Yeah, yeah, but, but if you want to simulate the flow, you would need to basically have the top and the bottom. You, you track the waters. 
That's what we do here. Is we track how the waters move, and from that we can calculate the flux of the membrane. It's an approximation, but we can calculate the flux of the membrane. And the flux that we get is 10 times higher than our aquaporins. So this thing is basically acting like a sieve. And, but yes, what you're, what you're wondering about is exactly what we, we, we do. We have a way of, of, of um, you know, we, we have code that will track individual water molecules. And we're watching which molecule, water molecules move up. And sometimes, you know, if it's, if it's packed too tight, they, they won't get in there. What you'll see is um, the waters will come in and then bounce right back out again if it's too tightly packed. And um, I mean, I don't actually run those calculations. My collaborators do. Uh, they're at the University of Illinois, and I managed to not put their names on. Um, they, um, they've been simulating aquaporins for years, and they know how to sort of evaluate them. No, no. There's a lot of people who do this, but it's, uh, can't pronounce his last name, but his student Carl that I work with all the time. Um, Carl, yeah, it's good. It, it, it is. Thank you. It's almost done. Is yeah. there any other questions to do? Yeah. Uh, when you say filtering the water, are you trying to do that using filtering for some dirt from the water? Filtering anything bigger than water. Uh, so ions like sodium chloride, you, you want to filter, you want to purify, you want to when seawater into drink. Seawater is sodium chloride in water, and the sodium and the chloride ions have waters wrapped around them. And if a sodium chloride ion is going to fit through there, you have to strip those waters off. So if you make the constriction tight enough, then the penalty to strip those waters off is too high for it to get through. So what happens to the constriction that They accumulate on one end of on one side of the membrane and they have to be flushed away. You would not use this as like a dead end pushing stuff through. You have to use it in a sort of a countercurrent flow arrangement, the way we do reverse osmosis now. You, f you flow seawater over, and what you come out with on the other side is brine, and on the other side of the membrane is pure water. These are very robust. I think they could be a very, very long time. Our aquaporins have lifetimes in the, in the order of hours to days because they are made out of scrambled egg. Um, but we constantly recycle them. But these things are, are much more robust, and they could last a lot longer. Um, there's all sorts of issues with fouling, and uh, yeah, fouling, basically. Um, where, and you'd have to back flush them periodically to clear them out. Um, but we, we do all that stuff with reverse osmosis membranes now. There's nothing. These are better than reverse osmosis membranes. I mean, our own membranes are terrible technology, they're just the best technology. Okay, in my functionist timekeeper, uh, maybe you can 